having speak about Cape Town, I pass now the floor to the two co-chair of this session, and it is on my right, Ronnie Castrils and Miguel Angel Estrella. You have the floor and you chair this session. Just, we're going to chair this now. Yeah. So shall I begin? Well, thank you very much, uh, Pierre. We're chasing time, given the delay, not the, uh, the fault of the Russell Tribunal, but we need to get a move on. And uh, the session now, and your program's the introductory session, uh, which was meant to start at 10.30, we're really at 11.010 or nearly 11.15 now. So without any further ado, I would like, we would like here uh, with uh, Miguel Angel Estrella to call uh, on Ilan Pape, who will address the tribunal on the topic, the birth of Zionism and its impact on the Palestinians. I've lost sight of Ilan, and where is his seat? Over here. Thank you. You've got 13 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> he, he has 13 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the tribunal. Thank you all for attending this important event. It's very difficult to condense a historical analysis and transform it into an evidence. Uh, but I will try to do that uh, by focusing on five bullet points, five points from the past that I think are still very relevant for the present. And uh, understanding them well probably will impact our ability to engage with the future. And I bring them as part of a knowledge that I think has to be integrated into any attempt to judge, understand, and hopefully suggest a solution for the troubled land in which I was born and in which I still try and live. The first point is about the impact of early Zionism on Palestine, which I think has to be taken into account of any analysis of the present. As you probably know, Zionism began as a noble movement that had two impulses that one can understand. The <coughs> impulse to find security for Jews in Central and Eastern Europe, and a wish to redefine Judaism as nationalism, as so many other religious and cultural groups did in the mid of the 19th century. The problem with that noble movement was when it decided that the only territory where it can implement these two impulses was a land already inhabited by other people, the land of Palestine. The Zionist uh, fallacy or mythology that Palestine was a land without people, waiting for the people without land, has already successfully been challenged by professional historiography. But I think it's still somehow uh, not accepted by everyone with a power to impact the reality in Israel and Palestine. It is very important to understand that Zionism appeared as a late day colonialism in Palestine. Now, it was not only a colonialist movement that appeared later than most other colonialist movements. It is also a colonialist movement that appeared in a region where colonialism was not very successful. The only place that was properly colonized was Algeria, and there, the people of Algeria, as you know, resisted eventually <coughs> successful, in a successful way, the French colonization of Algeria. 
It was not to be expected that the Palestinians would react differently to the idea that someone can come and colonize their country at an age and time where colonialism was already understood to be a power of force that undermines and ruins native societies into which it landed and into which it entered. So I think the first point, and a very important point, is to understand that Palestine <coughs> was a thriving place, a thriving society when Zionism entered the land. And it is good to play a little bit with alternative history and understand that had Zionism not arrived in Palestine, there was a good chance that the Palestinian society, like any other Arab society, would have developed on a similar way, from a nation state to a force for liberation and a place that has a history and identity which was mostly Arab, Islamic, and Middle Eastern. And all these features that are still characterize other Arab countries have been lost in the case of Palestine. The second point I would like to make is about the basic attitudes of early Zionists towards the native indigenous population of Palestine. What is imp important to understand is that these basic attitudes and perceptions of the natives have not changed and they still inform most of the Israeli Jews' uh, attitudes towards the Palestinians, wherever they are, whether we are talking about politicians, generals, <coughs> academics, or common people, these perceptions that were formulated at the very beginning of Zionism are still a very important part of the uh, 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 attitude today that is behind Israeli policies in the occupied territories towards the Palestinian minority and towards the question of the refugees. Now these first impressions were that the Palestinians were foreign aliens present in a country that waited to be redeemed by the Jewish people. The early settlers who were uh, obsessive diarists and nothing escaped their diary, not one mosquito bite, <laughs> and have not ceased to write about the people who hosted them when they first came to Palestine, the people who gave them shelter, the people who taught them for the first time how to cultivate land. They did not forget to mention that these very people were usurpers, were aliens who overtook or took over something that belonged to the Jewish people uh, 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 2,000 years ago. The idea of an alien native is very peculiar to the Zionist movement and is at the heart of the Zionist and Israeli policies towards the Palestinians. The third point I would like to make is that Zionism in the mandatory period between 1918 and 1948 had failed in two respects, although it had many, many impressive successes. It failed demographically and it failed geographically. Demographically, it failed because the basic impulse of Zionism was to create a democratic society, but at the same time, a Jewish society. Hence, in order for the democracy to be valid, what you needed was a, a solid or even exclusive Jewish majority. In order to get a Jewish majority, you needed to bring as many Jews as you could to Palestine and to find ways of getting rid of the Palestinians on the other hand. When the British have left Palestine in 1948, only one third of the population were Jews in Palestine. That was one failure from a Zionist perspective. The second failure was geographical. The Zionist movement tried to buy and purchase land to create a Jewish state. By the end of the British mandate, it succeeded in buying only 7% of the land of Palestine. The inevitable result of these two failures was the decision in February 1947 by the Zionist movement to ethnically cleanse Palestine. And as we are within a framework of a tribunal which has a legal orientation, let me remind the ladies and gentlemen of the tribunal 
that ethnic cleansing is a crime against humanity. It's a crime against humanity that only genocide is above it. It is a precise act by one movement of ethnic origin against another. And if you go to the State Department website, to its legal side, you will see a very clear definition of what are the origins of ethnic cleansing, what are the characteristics of ethnic uh, cleansing, and what are the inevitable results of ethnic cleansing. And you will see that the case study of Zionism and Palestine in 1948 fit like a hand to a glove in this respect. I would remind us all in this uh, respect that the Israeli narrative today about that particular period is that whatever happened to the Palestinians, and that includes even Israelis who feel some compassion towards the catastrophe that befell the Palestinian people, the main claim, which unfortunately some Palestinians even accept, is that the Palestinian leadership is responsible for the catastrophe. Had the Palestinians, not, had the Palestinians accepted the United Nations Petition Resolution, then the ethnic cleansing would have been prevented. This very immoral judgment has to be challenged at least on two bases. One is that before the Arab world decided to use force in order to reject the petition planned by the United Nations, namely before the 15th of May 1948, and before it was clear what are the positions of the sides because the United Nations deliberation on Palestine continued, before these deliberations ended, already half of the Palestinians became refugees. Namely, the Zionist plan to dispossess the Palestinians had nothing to do with the Palestinian position on the partition plan. The idea to dispossess Palestine, to de-Arabize Palestine, was there from the 1930s and was implemented long before it was clear what would be the Palestinian position on partition or what would be the United Nations uh, ideas of peace. Secondly, even the argument that's saying that if the Palestinian leadership rejected partition, which is understandable because the Algerians would have rejected, rejected the partition of Algeria between themselves and the French settlers, even if the argument is that the rejecting the partition was wrong, it cannot be punished by the destruction of half of Palestine's villages, by the destruction of half of Palestine's cities, and by the expulsion of half of Palestine's population. Nothing justifies such an inhuman barbarity. Definitely not a political decision to ask the, that wanted the international community to reconsider the idea of a solution because most of the Palestinians and most of the people who lived in the Arab world did not like the idea of partition. So I think it's important not to fall into the trap when these historical facts are being brought about as if they justify anything that Israel did. And I re repeat my assertion that what they did was an ethnic cleansing operation, which is a crime against humanity. The fourth point I would like to make is that we should not forget in such a tribunal what the Palestinian community inside Israel has undergone, especially in the period 1948 to 1966, when it was subjected to a policy of mandatory emergency regulations that restricted every uh, human and uh, civil right that the Palest that Palestinian minority had. It's important to understand that historical period between 1948 to 1966 because the very same military regime that was imposed on one-fifth of the Israeli citizens was transplanted into the West Bank and the Gaza Strip in 1967. When you see the history in one go, or as a complete picture, you understand that since the fragmentation of the Palestinian people to different geopolitical groups inside Israel, in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, in the refugee uh, uh, camps and in the exile, exilic communities, you understand that Israel does not always deal directly with each of that group. And not always the same group constitutes in the eyes of the Israelis a 
danger to the existence of Israel. So the power of Israel is transferred from one Palestinian group to the other in 1967. And the Israelis had ready-made mechanism which has violated already then, when it was imposed inside Israel, every international convention, every human right and civil right idea. So the Jewish state, in many ways, is a long history of systematic violation of human rights and civil rights, not just its policy towards the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and I hope we are not going to forget this in this important tribunal. And finally, I would like to explain again the occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, because there is a tendency, a very natural tendency, to look at the history of the occupation as if it is not part of a longer history of colonization and dispossession, as if really everything until 1967 was fine, enlightened, and does not deserve our attention. In fact, I don't think we can understand the Israeli policies in 1967 and after 1967 if we don't take a longer historical view on these events. The Israeli political and military leadership of 1948 regretted the fact that it had not occupied the West Bank in that year and had not ceased to dream about the annexation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip to Israel in order to make the Jewish state, in their eyes, a more viable strategic unit and a more viable moral unit, namely redeeming the very ancient heartland of the Jewish people, which were in the West Bank, not inside Israel. The, ma the main establishment of the army, of the political elite, has never given up the idea of creating a greater Israel between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean. What they were looking for was the historical opportunity. And few times before 1967, they already thought the opportunity was there, but it did not materialize. It materialized in 1967. And when it materialized in 1967, what the Israeli political elite decided then and there is something that no subsequent Israeli government has ever deviated from. And I think we were all, some of us, were fallen into the trap to think, in thinking that there was a new Israeli thought about peace, about reconciliation, about justice, that emerged after 1967. This is not true. This is absolutely not true. In 1967, the most consensual Israeli government ever, that included every political party in Israel in 1967, decided or took three decisions which are with us, and with this I would end, and I think have to be understood and would cast a question mark about ideas such as occupation, the peace process, and a two-state solution. And the three decisions are the following. Maybe there was a preliminary decision I would like just to mention, which is only Israel is going to decide the fate of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The rest will accept or reject an Israeli ideas of how best to deal with these territories. There is no agency for anyone else, not for an international mediator, not for the Palestinian or the Arab world. Israel will decide what is the best idea to deal with the, West, the new territories, the new Palestinian territories it had occupied in June 67. That was a preliminary decision. The first decision was that the Palestinian population of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip would not be ethnically cleansed as the Palestinians of 80% of Palestine were ethnically cleansed in 1948. In these 20% of Palestine that Israel occupied in 1967, the Palestinians were allowed to stay. It was an Israeli decision. It was not a successful struggle against a policy of expulsion. It was a decision not to expel. Maybe it would have failed. I don't know. But they decided not to expel. And they had a serious discussion about the possibility of ethnically cleansing Palestine once more. That is, 20% of Palestine that were not expelled, in, in, were not occupied in 1948. The second decision was that these territories cannot be in the Ure annexed to the state of Israel. 
that you cannot officially annex these areas. Because if you annex them officially, you are, unlike in 1948, are going to encounter international rejection. And the same policy, and we forgot about it, Israel annexed in 1950, in sheer violation of international law, the parts of the United Nations petition resolutions that were allocated to the Palestinians in November 1947. In 1950, quietly, through the Israeli Knesset, the parliament, the Israelis annexed these territories that belonged, according to the international community, to the Palestinian people. And they uh, learned the lesson then that if the international community is silent about the ethnic cleansing of 1948, it would be silent about the annexation of the Arab territories into the state of Israel, and they would be silent about the de facto annexation of the West Bank into Israel. Israel was never interested in the Gaza Strip as such. So the main focus was on the West Bank. The last uh, decision that was taken is, was that if you do not expel the people and you do not annex officially the territories, you have to decide what would be the status of the people there. And there and then in 1967 fell the decision to create something which we have never seen anywhere else in modern history. The idea of citizenless citizens in a mega prison that was built in 1967. That mega prison, as you can see today, has two versions. One version is a maximum security facility when the Palestinians reject the Israeli rule, when they resist by force or by, no, by non-violent means the occupation, then they are being punished with a kind of uh, uh, forms of maximum security uh, 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 prisons we have seen uh, in 1987, in 2002, and we are watching today uh, in the siege and ghettoizing of Gaza. So that's one uh, model. The other model is the one that attracted the world's attention and produced a lot of scholarship and a lot of support. That's the idea of the open prison. The open prison is a gift given by the Israelis to the Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip should they behave according to the Israelis' ideas of reconciliation. And when they accept it, they can have autonomous life. And the idea of autonomy develops in the 1980s into the idea of a Bantustan, a mini-state. We always have to remember the idea of two states is a Zionist idea. No normal Palestinian would ever suggest to divide his or her homeland into two states. That doesn't stand to reason altogether. It's unfortunate that a lot of our good friends, some of them are here, I'm sure, are still supporting this as a paradigm for peace. And I think this is false. This is wrong. And with this, I would end and ask and beseech the tribunal, do not shrink Palestine into 20% of its geography and do not shrink the Palestinian people into 50% of who they are. If we are going to seek a just and peaceful solution to the raging conflict there, we should include everyone who is affected and who was affected so that we can build together a stable future. Thank you. May I remember the rules, please? No clapping. No clapping. Um, I'd really like to thank Professor Len Pepe. Uh, there's much we can thank him for, but to thank him for being so succinct, Elan, you were very quick uh, and dealt with this in 20 minutes and have given us a little bit of time. Um, we'll come to some questions now ask you to do your best to respond to us. Um, I'd, I'd like to raise a question and ask you for a comment, in fact. Uh, the noted British historian um, who's just died, Eric Hobsbawm, I'm sure you, you know well, it was very sad that he, he expired the other day, but uh, he's made a very noted statement about history was widely quoted in the British papers, the business 
of historians is to tell people about what has been forgotten. Business of historians to tell people about what has been forgotten. You belong to an exceptional group of historians, um, the new historians in Israel, who have produced a narrative that has turned Zionism absolutely upside down, created big problems for the Zionist narrative. Um, what I'd like to ask you is, in, in your opinion, how far do you believe that telling the right story, which you're trying to do with many other outstanding, both Palestinian and Israeli historians, um, how far this is making headway with the Israeli people, but for us here in the setting, for the American public and for the United Nations, because clearly it's extremely important that here in the United States, key supporter of Israel, that we've managed to turn around the thinking which you so well present and the opportunities with the United Nations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. I think in this I take my lead from the late Edward Said, who uh, in 1982 wrote a brilliant article called The Permission to Narrate. And I think what he wanted us to, and to believe in, and I think it's part of his legacy, was that even if you are disempowered, politically, economically, or militarily, nobody can rob you of your right to tell your history the way you want to tell it. And that maintaining that right is a powerful tool that eventually may also redress the other balance, the economic balance, the military balance, and the diplomatic balance. And therefore, I do think that Hearing a different narrative, a different version of events, which clearly shows where criminality and inhumanity was taking place, which clearly points to who were the criminals, who were the perpetrators, and does not evade issues of morality and ethical dimension, eventually makes its ways indirectly to the way politicians, journalists, and the common public relates to the issue of Palestine. Uh, we, you know, the main problem, Ronnie, in, in, in Palestine is that daily events in Palestine are not catastrophic enough for mainstream media. The only way the mainstream media understand that it's facing a criminality is when it takes an accumulative perspective. And for taking that accumulative perspective, in order to understand the magnitude of the Israeli inhuman policies towards the Palestinians, you need that historical perspective. So I'm a great believer in it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Would you like to raise a question? <coughs> Bonjour. Um, je viens d'Argentine. Um, la question de la dépossession. One minute. One minute. Sorry, my French minute. isn't that good. I want to understand perfectly. De la déposición jusqu'à l'occupation. Okay. Et moi, ça m'a pris longtemps pour, pour le comprendre. Et comme une grande partie de, de l'humanité, adolescent, dans, dans les années 50, je, je participais à tous les combats qui défendaient l'histoire du peuple juif. Et la plupart des, des, des musiciens de l'orchestre de ma ville natale à Tucumán venaient d'échapper et, et faisaient partie de cette énorme diaspora juive qui est arrivée en Argentine. Alors, j'ai participé à tout ça, et convaincu, etc. Et même quand j'avais 20 ans, ma, ma femme et moi, on avait choisi dans notre entourage une mère juive, une femme de Pologne qui vit toujours et qui était notre mère juive, pour nous, chrétiens, ma femme et moi. Alors, et, on, ça nous a pris très longtemps. Pour moi, c'était en 88, 
pour la première fois euh, de ma vie, je suis, je, je suis allé jouer à Moyen-Orient, entre autres dans des villes palestiniennes. Et j'ai eu accès à, à visiter un camp de, de, de Palestiniens. C'était le Ramadan de, de 88, et bouleversant pour moi, parce que c'est à partir de ce moment-là que j'ai compris ce que c'était non seulement la dépossession, mais l'occupation. Alors, euh, quand j'ai visité ces, ces camps palestiniens, j'ai voulu parler surtout à des jeunes couples palestiniens qui avaient énormément d'enfants. Et je leur posais la même question à, à, à tous. Que faites-vous devant cette humiliation de la dépossession et l'occupation Alors la réponse était toujours la même. Nous font des enfants et un jour nous serons plus nombreux. Chose qui m'a effrayé, vraiment ça m'a effrayé. Quand je suis rentré de, de, de cette tournée, j'étais complètement habité par l'idée d'un orchestre, un orchestre de, de, de chrétiens, des arabes, des de juifs et des musulmans du monde, du monde arabe, un, un orchestre pour la paix. Alors, au même temps, et Arafat, Shimon Peres et Rabin recevaient le prix de constructeur de la paix de l'UNESCO. Cette même UNESCO qui, qui a décidé cette année de reconnaître l'État palestinien. Il a fallu ramer beaucoup, 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 parce que l'information, en plus, les médias sont des responsables aussi du manque d'information pour que l'ensemble de la population mondiale comprenne ce que c'est l'humiliation de la dépossession et de l'occupation. De, de Alors, j'avais eu droit, Dieu merci, à un entretien avec Shimon Peres, Rabin et Arafat, et quand je leur ai posé la question de l'Orchestre pour la paix, Arafat a réagi immédiatement en disant « ça serait un miracle, si tu peux le faire, c'est bravo, chapeau, mais il va être très difficile pour toi, figure-toi, si tu vas en Irak, tu ne pourras pas dire le mot « juif », tu ne pourras pas dire le mot « Israël », tu ne pourras pas dire le mot « shalom ». Alors parle toujours des enfants d'Abraham, c'est comme ça que j'ai pu construire cet orchestre avec les enfants d'Abraham. Bon, il y a beaucoup d'autres choses à dire, mais le temps, le temps paraît-il, est contraire à... C'est un autre testimony. Merci, merci. Ok, merci. Ok, merci. Est-ce que vous avez une question Je pense que c'était une question. Ok, sure. Ok. Mais très intéressante anecdote, merci. Nous avons une question de Mark Mansfield, oui Oui, ici une question. And the question is directed to the way forward, which is one part of these sessions. I appeared before CERD, the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, in Geneva earlier this year, where the committee pointed out to Israel that it had failed to comply with pretty well any of its recommendations over the past decade. And one of the delegates made this point, and I, I'd like your observations on this that the existence of Israel had a precondition. And the precondition was that it would, in fact, institute a pluralist society in which equal rights were accorded to all. That was the intention. And of course, we know what happened is that the Declaration of Independence by Israel and the basic law of Israel does no such thing. In fact, there is no mention of Palestine or the Palestinians in their basic law, and certainly no according of equal rights. Now, with a state that is refusing dogmatically to make any changes to basic law, how do we progress this matter towards an equitable solution? Yes, thank you. 
Um, I, I think, first of all, you're right. It's historically, I think the United Nations Resolution 181, which is popularly uh, known as the Partition Resolution, assumed that uh, equal rights would be granted to the Jews, Jewish inhabitants who would be in the Arab state and the Palestinian inhabitants who would be part of the Jewish state. But by the time that resolution became uh, part of the official policy of the United Nations, Israel has already violated that very promise by expelling by force the Palestinians uh, from most of the areas that became the Jewish state and by imposing on the very few that were allowed to stay a military rule. And I think when you are born in a sin, in a way, you find it very difficult to get rid of it. Now, as for the future, how do you deal with it? Well, one has to understand that for most Israeli politicians, pundits, and public, uh, international law is tantamount to anti-Semitism mm. as an attitude of the international community, forgetting, of course, that the most important contribution to that law uh, were the result of the international community's abhorrence with the Holocaust in Europe. So I don't think that one should give up pointing to the Israelis where they violate the international law, but one should not expect that just by doing that, you will succeed in changing the Israeli basic attitudes towards the Palestinians. I think that acknowledging the violation is one thing, Forcing the violator to be accountable for that violation is far more important. Now, the international community does not have to invent any new wheels. We have clear non-violence means in our capacity as international communities, as national communities, to uh, exert pressure on the Israelis to begin at least uh, obeying some of, the of their international commitments, not all of them. And uh, I think that uh, so far the political and economic elites, especially of the West, are either afraid or unwilling to do it. But I think that one cannot escape the conclusion that it's not just the analysis of the violation that is important, but also the prognosis of how to stop it from the outside which is very crucial to what we should do in the future. Okay, thank you so much. Um, well, there's a time for one short question from the tribunal members. One more question, if anybody would like to raise one. Uh, Stefan. I am very grateful to Ilan Pape. I wanted to ask him, do you have the feeling that the knowledge within Israel of the historical realities that you have brought forward is making some progress. We have, of course, friends in Israel who feel exactly like you, but up to now, they're a very small minority. Do you have the feeling that what you are bringing and some other modern historians is making some progress in the minds particularly of Israeli youth, and perhaps particularly in the mind of Israeli soldiers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm afraid the two questions are connected, the question of analyzing what should be done and how far can the Israeli society transform from within, including through a better understanding of the historical facts and the historical uh, uh, past. And I think that this there are the beginnings of change among the younger generation in understanding. Uh, I'm troubled, however, by two uh, aspects of this change. One is, of course, that it's a very slow change. And, and education is a far uh, slower process than any other process of human transformation we know about. You have to deprogram people in order to make them open-minded enough to accept an unpleasant past. And not everybody likes to look at the mirror and see an unpleasant uh, uh, f uh, figure there. The second aspect, which is even more troubling to my mind, is that while we started the debate in Israel, the debate was factual. Do we tell the truth or don't we tell the truth? 
This is gone. We are not debating the debates anymore, uh, the, the facts anymore. We are debating their morality. And a large section of young Israelis believe that expelling the Palestinians in 1948, imposing military regime on the Palestinian minority inside Israel, and imposing in, uh, a military rule and occupation and collective punishment and siege on the Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip is a, an ethical, accepted policy by the government. I have not seen demonstrations of any significant magnitude against the immorality or inhumanity of these policies or in relations to the historical facts which I've mentioned. Which means that like in some other cases in history, again, you need something more powerful to trigger a realization that what you are condoning, what you are complacent about, and what you support is rejected by most conscience, conscientious and decent people around the globe. Thank you so much. Uh, we'd love to have you here longer. Um, I would like to say that it's been extremely noted, Ilan, how brave you've been, and thank you. Oui, sur le thème de l'implication des Nations Unies sur la question palestinienne depuis le mandat jusqu'au présent. Personnellement, comme dans beaucoup d'autres affaires, comme l'affaire de Malouine en Argentine, il y a un double standard dans les Nations Unies et dans beaucoup d'organisations mondiales du fait que certains pays pays ont droit à ne pas intervenir quand ça ne leur convient pas et quand il s'agit des pays émergents par exemple par contre et la loi est, est cruelle et sans, et sans, sans aucune sorte d'humanisme.